I'm the first one to speak. I'd like to introduce my old friend and colleague, John Griffith, from Bradford, a small town near Leeds. He was going to address the topic of the disaster transferred from sent elsewhere. Mr Griffith. This small town in Leeds has got a World Heritage site in it, and it, that's, that's a hockney picture of Saltair Mill. And if I ever go to Bradford, don't believe all the rumours. It is a very beautiful spot. Anyway, um, thank you very much, Peter, for asking me to talk. Um, he's given me a strict timetable because he wants to be in the pub by three o'clock. So I'm, I, if I go a bit quick, just tell him, someone to tell me to slow down. Um, I've been coming to Belfast for 27 years since I met my soon-to-be wife. I'd recommend it to you very highly. If you've not been around Northern Ireland, you can go to the Giants Causeway and the very eminent um, hostelries where you can chat to the locals and enjoy a, quite, a, a pint of Guinness. What is a disastrous referral? Um, there's very little in the literature as to exactly what is a disastrous referral, and that's probably why Peter asked me to talk, because he knows I'll give an opinion rather than re research it evident, um, avidly. Well, who's making the referral? What's the patient? What condition have they got? What does their imaging say they've got? What's the patient's status when you're taking them? Probably most importantly, to defend yourself going forward, is what does the patient think is going to happen and what's their knowledge of their condition? And are there any problems with their quality of care? Well, this is an example of a referral I got on a Friday afternoon. Um, please accept this 18-year-old. She's been discussed at the upper GI MDT and she's got a myosarcoma. Referral came from the FY2. I'm a colorectal surgeon, not an upper GI surgeon. And I got a photocopy of the nursing administration documents and the latest sheet of OBS. What she actually was, was a, an 18 year old with a four year history of an abdominal swelling, two weeks of persistent vomiting and intermittent constipation. It's not quite what we were told. She was kept it, had an epigastric fullness, and you can see from a use and ease that she had a degree of acute kidney injury and it also was a little bit hypokalemic. Another patient. Our stents get done by the gastroenterologists, but they don't really think about it because if they can't get the stent in by Friday afternoon, that's not their problem. So we got there's this patient coming for a stent Friday morning. Looked into it a little bit more. Do you know anything about this patient? Oh, well, she's 76. She's got a lesion at a splenic flexor. And what about her background? Um, she might be an arteriopath, and she might have chronic obstructive lung disease. Lo and behold, she's got respiratory failure. And as a simple evidence, just to examine her there and then, she had bilateral femoral bruise before we even started and was a claudicant. So ignoring all that lack of documentation we received, lack of notification, how do you approach the patient when you get them? Well, one of the important things to do is to look at their imaging, because it might not be what you're told it's going to be. One of the problems with imaging is that not all computer systems talk to each other. But if you, so if you haven't got up-to-date, accurate imaging, I would recommend that you repeat it. So this is the first case I mentioned to you, and she said to have a myosarcoma in her stomach. The observant members of the audience will notice that she's also got a degree of small bowel obstruction. Why has she got small bowel obstruction with a myosarcoma? I can hear you asking, well, she's also got a stricture in a terminal like mid um, ileum and a further mass there. She's actually got a trichobezoar, which ended up being removed on the Sunday when we've resuscitated a bit further. And we also took two further, two further small bezoars out of her small bowel. Second patient, even the least observant members of the audience can see she's got a dilated small bowel, a dilated colon, and there's a stenotic lesion in the descending colon. 
Unfortunately, the referring hospital's radiologist had missed the very subtle finding of a liver metastasis in segment four. So we were given a misdiagnosis and a misstaging. The patient was sent down expecting to have surgery by an upper GI specialist to treat their gastric tumor. It's not quite what happened really. The other patient was told, oh, you're going to have a stent place which will treat your cancer. What did happen? Well, in the first young lady, she had a colorectal surgeon operate on her, not a specialist of a GI surgeon, who took out a couple of trichobezoars out of her stomach and a small bowel. The second patient had a stent placed and then went on to have a laparoscopic subtotal colectomy. It was then referred on to Leeds liver unit and had that liver metastasis treated. But none of this was anywhere near the communication that had been given to the patient or to us. There are patient safety issues, and these are very, very difficult and politically problematic to address. The first girl was sent down with AKI, malnourished, with pressure area care, and she'd also had misstaging, and both of them had been misstaged or misdiagnosed. Any transfer that you get, I think it's mandatory that you restage them, sort out your documentation, and clearly, clearly document what the condition of the patient is, because there may, it will save you from problems four or five months down the line when someone's writing a letter to say to you, would you like to comment on this patient's condition? If you do know someone in the adjacent trust who sent you this patient, what should you do about it? Well, you could speak to them and say, look, this patient came down with this and this, and they weren't ideally managed. But if that's not available or you've tried that approach and been bounced back, you probably need to discuss it with your medical director, both for defense for yourself and your institution against any possible litigation. There's a lot of work, both in the College of Surgeons and from GMC about good handover. It predominantly focuses, or does solely focus, on handover between shifts from one junior to another set of junior, or one team to another team who are changing shifts. And they talk about situation or SBAR. And I'm sure you're all aware that it's situation, what's the background to the case, what's your assessment, and what's the recommendation. There's nothing in the literature for general surgical transfer. There is for trauma networks and there are neurosurgeons. If we have to send something neurologically into Leeds, we have to fill in a, a very strict pro forma as to what it covers. But we don't have any strict transfer documents. It's an international problem. 61,000 US patients transferred in an eight year period. It is noticed that these patients have an increased incidence of sepsis, comorbidity, and emergency surgery rates. They've got worse outcomes, and even on a case per match study, transfer in itself can be dangerous. 20% of patients on a transfer may well en um, encounter um, a deterioration in their condition, and in four to five percent of those, it's a significant um, change in their blood pressure. Their recommendation from this study was, we require efficient communication with medical records and adequate imaging. And that would certainly be our experience, but there is nothing documented to stipulate it. They also found that over two time periods of four years, that the incidence went from, of transfers went from 3% to 5%. And that's a significant number of patients. So not only in the UK, but also in the US, the rural surgeons are reducing the amount of work that they will do. What do I think you can do to avoid a disastrous referral? Well, I think the referral has to be made by a senior clinician, not by an FY2. If you look at what the anaesthetists do, 
when they transfer a patient on an inter-hospital transfer from ITU, it's taken by the SBR. It's not taken by the SHO. It would not be a good use of manpower to get a consultant from one hospital to bring another patient from down with them, but they should at least be able to do a summary of, that doc of their documentation and email it to you. I think it is important, and I think we've heard this this morning from Gordon Carlson's talk, it's important that you get accurate imaging. Make sure that if they're being transferred in, you know what the imaging shows, it's adequate, it's up to date, and it's appropriate. And get someone who you rely on, who you can rely on, who you respect to report it. If there's a problem with the patient status, clearly document it and optimize that patient. Finally, I think the communication of the situation to the patient and clarification of what you're going to do for them, what their diagnosis is, and what your treatment plan is, is very, very important. I think it's worthwhile documenting that in the notes because it will, it will these patients are sent down, often in a slightly um, unstable position. They may well be septic. They may well not remember everything that you're going to have told them. And if possible, relay all your information to an advocate because it will prevent further problems as you go forward. Fundamentally, what prevents a problem with a difficult handover is communication. It's not the case. I dealt with a supposed surgical upper GI problem. It is not the, the patient. You can resuscitate patients. The problem is the communication, both of the notes and to the patient. A bit like it's happened in Belfast, it's important that we talk. And this is possibly best done in a local hostelry. Thanks very much. Thanks, John. It's very clear and very concise, particularly the uh, advice at the end there. Just one question. What advice would you have if you were uh, identifying a repeat offender, as in a hospital or surgical service that's sending you repeated problems like this without making things clear. How do you deal with that? I think you've got to go down the line and you've got to document and you've got to keep a record of your documents. So uh, I keep a, it, it's not, a, we, we haven't got a repeat offender, but I do have a record of all those patients who've come down as a transfer who I feel there's an issue of. And then if, there, if you think that that's getting a problem, you've got to go to, you, to your medical director and approach it through your medical director and get him to speak, to prevent the, present the evidence to his, the adjacent trust's medical director. You can't do it on a personal level. Thank you. Thanks, John. Next speaker is Hugh Gallagher. Hugh uh, works in Newcastle, where he was appointed in 1999. He's taken Newcastle by the scruff of the neck and shaken it. Um, he's the hardest working man in rock and roll and he was going to address the topic of dealing with the unattractive abdominal wall. Well he was. Thank you. Hi there, thanks for inviting me. Pete. Pete's asked me to come and speak because I'm Glaswegian and I can speak 45 minutes worth of information in 12 and I've been instructed to do so. So we move on with the first slide. Now, I've been asked to talk about the unattractive abdominal wall as part of on-call on -call challenges. Now, definitions are problems. Some people may say that this is an attractive abdominal wall, but for me, this man does nothing. Some may disagree in the audience. Now, for me, that's an attractive abdomen. I want to spend some time with that abdomen. So let's, let's, let's move on from what attraction actually means and what surgery's done to me as a human being. Okay. My aim is to overview the challenging abdominal wall scenarios. When are they going to hit you? And I want to talk about two really important points, tailoring. We have to tailor to individual patients in this complex area and the toolkit you have and what you have to work with. Now, the majority of us are going to find a horrible abdomen basically is a complication of a hernia. They're going to come in. Often they'll be obstructed. If they're obstructed, you nearly always have time to stop, think, have a coffee, and talk to a friend. Rarely you have to interfere purely for obstruction. But sometimes life isn't so kind. You can have strangulation, which 
compels us to act in the middle of the night. And you can have different layers of complexity added on. It can be a lateral hernia. And increasingly in our society, with immediate reconstruction of breast cancer, we're seeing a lot of donor site complications, both immediately and delayed. We'll also get into trouble overnight in abdominal hernias when we have a coexisting hernia, just happens to be there, and they've got a perf DU or they've been stabbed, and you can't just go in and out and close the skin. You'll also be challenged by some very hostile abdomens when people have put implants in as eye palms, and that can give you terrible problems. We'll mention trauma, and we'll mention the compartment syndrome. So here's your toolkit. Whenever you see a lot of choices, it means the literature and the science is not mature. But basically, in your surgical toolkit, it ranges from a simple laparoscopic hernia repair after you drag a little bit of bowel in, all the way through to laparostomy. We still have the old techniques of onlay mesh that I mentioned only really to deprecate. We should now be aiming for the more modern techniques of reeve stopper, component separation, and the save all, the eye palm. Even more bewildering, I gave a similar lecture some 10 years ago when I said there was 200 synthetics. There's now 430 on the European market. They're meshes, they're foils, they're macro or microporous, they're absorbable, non-absorbable, they're biographs, they're hybrid biograph meshes. It's difficult, but there is some guidance out there for us to hold on to. Here's one thing. There are some common principles when you approach a nasty abdominal wall, no matter how it's caught you out. Principle one, if you're going to do a hernia, cover the whole scar. Don't just do a singular defect. There's very few exceptions to this. You need a big implant, and your main aim here should be to minimize adhesions. Don't worry about what the skin looks like. Don't worry about exposing implants to the atmosphere. Just don't expose the implants to the bowel if you can help it. Use your omentum, use bladder, use sac elements. Don't get rid of your sac. Anything to protect your enteric uh, organs from the mesh itself and avoid excess fixation. So if we're tailoring, the first thing is, you have the patient in front of you, which of these 34 implants are you going to use that you keep in your stock cupboard? Well, we've got some help now. Uh, the European uh, Ventral Hernia Working Group has produced a good staging system. Broyings published this here in surgery 2010. And basically it ranges from grade one patients who are just straightforward without any problems. Grade two, you add in comorbidities, smoking, obesity, diabetes, etc. Grade three are the potentially contaminated when you enter small bowel, small bowel ischemia. And grade four, frankly infected cases, abdominal dehiscence, eh, anastomotic dehiscence, etc. And we can say quite clearly there is guidance. If you're dealing with an emergency patient who is in the low groups, groups one and two, you should be using simple, straightforward, low density prosthetic meshes. Your ultra pros, your pariatexes, your low density prosthetic meshes of whatever choice you wish. However, there's a stronger propensity for biologicals with, as the grade increases. And in cases of grade four or grade five, we should really be making efforts to stage the, the, the uh, repair. And this is just this expressed graphically. It's worth notice, noticing, noting that Giordano published recently out of London that comorbidity is probably as good a predictor of poor outcome as infection is. So you have to be aware that you will not get good re results in the comorbid. So, tailoring to the emergency patient. We move on from what implant we're going to use. We've now got some handle on whether we should be using prosthetics and when we should be using biologicals. We need to tailor it to the emergency patient. This isn't elective surgery. First of all, use damage control principles. Do not attempt more than that patient's physiology can withstand. How can you be helped with that? Well, first of all, put your patients in the kneel at audit. That will tell you how likely they are to die and pay some attention to it because it's pretty bloody accurate. Speak to your ICU staff, speak to your anaesthetists, and then decide what can the patient take from a stable patient who in the middle of the night I'll do multiple component separations on, all the way through to the unstable patient where I'll kiss them. I just keep it simple, stupid. You have to behave like that. And then it's when you use open abdomens, and even occasionally an onlay technique. Now, in terms of technique, when we reach into our toolkit, we've all seen this slide, where we have onlays, inlays, which are only there to show you that some people actually do that, and the proper placement behind the muscles. But 
all of these in a famous hernia textbook are still bridging and illustrates that bridging is not well understood. And I'll talk to that in a second. The evidence base clearly shows that if we're going to operate in the middle of the night or at any other time on midline hernias, we should be getting our meshes behind the rectus muscle, preferably in front of the, uh, preferably in front of the posterior rectus sheath. But if we're forced to by lateral hernia, stomas, etc., we can put it in repetitively. Bridging is important. Bridging leads to collaterals of force laterally, which result in failure. And if you look at Slater's work, the failure rates are over double in those who have bridging versus non-bridging uh, repairs. So we must try and bring the muscles together if we have the, the techniques. Sometimes you won't manage. Sometimes the defects are too large. Sometimes you complete loss of abdominal wall, lateral hernia, and then it's where you may consider onlay techniques. As you can see, a hernia like this with two, three 30 by 40 permacoles sutured together is not going to be brought together. Sometimes you just have to accept failure, but just save the patient. We're often challenged with the plastic surgery cases, such as these post tram flap areas. There's no, sometimes there's no true hernia. Sometimes the patient just has a perf DU, but at the end of the day, you've got to put that together. And that normally involves a contralateral a component separation, a reeve stopper contralaterally, and implantation of the mesh between the external and internal obliques on the other side. And that will take you some hours. So leave the belly open if you can't do that in an unstable patient. If not, that CT shows the kind of results you can get. Here's a case I did only the other week there. An acute VRAM failure was readmitted into hospital with eventration through a VRAM. You can see the complexity of previous repairs and just slowly you have to strip these things down, take each component apart, care to the bowel, transfascially fixate the meshes into place. And you note this is a very cheap polypropylene mesh because it was a reasonably fit breast cancer patient and there was no sepsis. So don't spend the money unless you have to. And then Sangmage mesh. The last slide there is very important. Always pressure monitor in these situations. Now, isn't this the quintessential problem on call? The patient who's had Crohn's disease, multiple laparotomies, they've got a slightly discharging mesh, bilateral hernia's an obstruction. Now, you're not going to get out of that. You have to operate on the patient, but how? First of all, understand the enemy. You can't beat this problem. Basic physics shows that all meshes contract. Biologicals, 12%, up to heavyweights, 30%, but all contract. And so, therefore, you will always have parastomal hernias. Learn to love them. Love your enemy. Otherwise, you'll be very unhappy. In a case such as this, I just excise any infected areas. Slowly work the sacs out. Could I always preserve the sac? Picture two shows the whole sac been lifted forward so I can protect the posterior bowel with the sac if there's no momentum. And then very slowly, just components separate and move your muscles until you arrive at closure. And that's the kind of post-op appearances you can get. This patient's had an eye palm, as you can see. I've showed you it's been pinned out. And we just literally take the stomas. We cut a hole in the mesh for the stomas to pull through. But you can get stable abdomens with time. Traumatic abdominal hernias. These are graded from about grades 1 to 6. They're very common. 50% in Dennis', Dennis patient series of 1,600 traumas. But thankfully, only, only two 3% are in grade 5 or 6, which necessitate immediate intervention. Here's the kind of case I'm talking about. 36-year-old man driving a BMW M5 who vaporised a Fiat 127. And that's the kind of picture you get. These kind of... Sorry for any Fiat drivers out there. Uh, he walked away from it, I hasten to add. Advert for BMW. This is the kind of damage you have. Muscles literally torn from the trunk. Uh, migration of the cecum into the buttocks. And you have to operate on that. Another case, 62-year-old female, grade 6, who eviscerated multiple injuries. And again, the similar type of picture. And we're seeing this more and more commonly at the major trauma centres. How do we deal with that? Well, we return to our trauma principles. You do a cattle brash manoeuvre. You suture your implant. I always use biologicals here because these patients have normal collagen behaviour. There's no reason why they need polypropylene forever. 
uh, I suture it onto the psoas muscle and then slowly take it round the abdomen using a tacker to fix it rapidly anteriorly. Do not tack the psoas muscle or near the femorals or near the IVC. And preserve the nerves as best you can. And that's the kind of outcome you see. You see the tacks anteriorly, but obviously you can't see the sutures. And I think you can see in the CT, the skin tear went all the way through to the skin. That's why we had to operate instantly there. However, it's wise to remember that little bon mot I said about damage control surgery. You really, really, really don't want to be taking on a four-hour hernia repair when you're doing this. So although I'm showing you these techniques, we have to use tailoring. Please tailor to what the patient can survive. It's really, really important. And as a, anybody who's had two fingers across at IVC will tell you, the last thing you feel that ordering now is a bit of mesh. Okay. Here's another problem you'll find. You'll find patients with very hostile abdomens. You'll find patients who've had ordinary uncoated meshes placed inside the cavity. This was a traveler who'd been stabbed. I didn't realize it was a previous surgeon, but after seven months as an inpatient, I understood the uh, inclination. And a case like this where you have complete fusion of your meshes to gut will just take you seven to eight hours just to scrape and scrape and scrape to get the, the case done. I'm afraid there's no fast, we have no tips for you, but don't make any more enterotomies. It makes the situation worse. Ultimately, we end up in the spectrum with an abdominal compartment syndrome, first described by Henry in the 1930s, who found how much water you had to pour into a dog to kill it. Try getting that one past the ethics committees now. But it's roughly 25 millimeters of mercury. Please remember when called to see patients whose kidneys have gone off with tense abdomens, they don't have to have had surgery. We see this a lot from burns wards. We see it in ICUs with over-resuscitation. And it's a complex clinical diagnosis based both on signs and measurements. The compartment syndrome itself is defined as over 22 millimetres of mercury. But I have many patients who have a higher than 22 millimetres of mercury abdomen. It has to be associated with the ventilatory failure and the renal failure. If you don't have those, you've got an intra-abdominal hypertension, which requires regular monitoring, but not necessarily intervention. Now, why does this come around? Well, basically, it's a complex cycle of tissue decreased perfusion caused by platelet aggregation and loss of capillary bed. Lots of work's been done to see how we can intervene with this with medicines. Manitol can sometimes work in burns, desferoxamine, xanthine oxidase inhibitors have all been mentioned. I just tell you about this just to say it doesn't work in the abdomen. You have to prescribe a swan morton. It's the only way, a large hole. You have to decompress the abdomen and then decide how you're going to manage it. Open, vax, temporary bridging mesh. I don't think it really matters that much, but you must control the sepsis if it's there, control the original uh, pathology. And basically your aim has to be within the next four to five days to reduce that pressure by increasing the abdominal volume, often through component separation. Now, the literature here, it is confusing. If we look at Blazneski's paper, very recently published, it suggests that all septic abdomens should be left open. We shouldn't be closing any of them because it's significantly better survival. In Atima's meta-analysis of the open abdomen in 2015, he suggests that low pressure Vax therapy both increases closure rates and reduces fistula rates. In Gordon Carlson's review in Annals of Surgery 2013, it suggested that negative pressure was safe. Negative pressure was safe, but it didn't... Uh, so I have to tap this to stop before Pete kills me. Uh, negative pressure is safe, but it does increase fistulation rate a little and decreases closure. So your toolkit in this situation, we've all heard of the off-site sandwich. Please beware it. People cough they struggle, and they even treat. So if you're going to use opsite sandwich, please stitch in. I prefer the Abthera system because it stops visceral parietal adhesions laterally, which allows me to do definitive work later. This is one that uh, Michael Nieper, I stole from him from Hamburg last week when we were speaking together. It's a lovely one. Sometimes you have to put a vicral mesh in still. But if you're going to do that, I often use an only vax as well. So I hope that's a whistle-stop tour across a very complicated subject, and I hope I've addressed some options and uh, techniques that you can use. Thank you.
one question, Hugh. If you've got mesh, not biological, um, stuck in a wound and you're trying to take it out, what tips do you have to try and get all of that mesh out? Any experience with that? Any top tips for the audience? Yeah, yeah I've removed about 35 infected meshes. Now, the joy of the infected ones is they leap out into your hand like a salmon. However, the ones... Chronically infected, the, stuck down ones. The chronically infected, stuck down ones. Sometimes it's too much of a sacrifice. Remove all the infected areas, but sometimes it's too much of a sacrifice to take all the abdominal wall out required to take it. In which case, I often put a biological mesh eye palm completely surrounding it and entirely inside omentum as well to exclude it. That's a technique I often use, but you have to take all the infected elements out. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker I'd like to invite onto the stage is an old friend of mine, Andrew Mavor. Andrew is a vascular surgeon from Leeds. The uh, population of West Yorkshire are grateful for him. He established an excellent trauma network in Leeds, and I personally am grateful to him, saving my career on many occasions when I've got into major pelvic bleeding. I love the man. It's Andrew Mavor <laughs> speaking on a bad day on trauma call. Thanks so much, Peter. I do appreciate that. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is going to be mostly about um, management and, and philosophy rather than too many gory slides because for me the biggest hurdle to uh, jump has been um, changing attitudes and, ch and changing the, the, the way in my particular trust that trauma has been managed. Um, I, I'm very lucky. It, you know the old adage about pick a lucky surgeon. I am very lucky and I, and I sort of turn up and, and things work out. And this, this is the Jubilee Wing, um, which opened a number of years ago. Now, if you were building a major trauma center from the ground up, you'd probably build it a bit like this, but I'd say the MTC inherited this building. The helipad is up here, emergency department here, uh, CT there, Anjo suite there, theatres in intensive care, um, vascular wards, a major trauma ward, uh, all in one group. And, and it does make life easy, but I appreciate that not everybody has my kind of luck. Um, how did it come about? We, well, I'm gonna tell you a little about the development of the service, about what, what we do at the moment. And I think it's quite timely to just spend a few minutes on where we go from here and, and how trauma surgery develops. Um, not just in the MTCs, but also taking into account the effect it's likely to have on the surrounding uh, trauma units, which are feeding into the MTCs. Um, how did it happen in Leeds? Uh, with, with a sort of masterly planning, um, we decided to move all of general surgery out of the infirmary six months before uh, the major trauma center opened. Uh, I recognize the vacuum there, um, and uh, I managed to bring my colleagues in vascular surgery along with me for the development. Uh, management were incredibly supportive, not least because we were the only game in town which helped. Um, uh, a colleague who wasn't too keen on the idea wrote to the, the colleges and the GMC, uh, and in fact we got a, nice letters back from them saying, uh, we, we've no objection, please go ahead, but we'll be watching you. Um, we looked at each other, looked at ourselves quite carefully, uh, the, the, the surgical team to say, you know, where are our weaknesses? What do we need to develop in order to try and provide a, a robust service? Um, and that was a bit unnerving at the time. Um, most of us had nice certificate saying that we were um, trained in general surgery, but it, it had been a while for some of us. Um, I took some comfort in the fact that the, the sort of, uh, this, this second peak, the preventable peak in, in trauma deaths is predominantly related to bleeding. And this is an absolutely fantastic book. Anybody with an interest in trauma just wants to find out a bit more about it, I can thoroughly recommend this book. And I thought I'd better put at least one graph uh, in my talk. And if you look at the number of pages devoted to the various topics, ahead of the game, what I was really worried about is what I do when I open my lesser sac and there's bile staining and there's obviously a pancreatic injury. And in fact, um, the, the big deal in 
in the early part of trauma surgery is about hemostasis, and that was a, a great, uh, great video there with that IVC. Um, so, you know, my conscience was clear, really, in saying, yes, as vascular surgeons, I think we can take on this uh, trauma management. And what we actually do is um, we attend the trauma calls, we, we do trauma rounds with our orthopedic colleagues, um, we attend the MTC governance, and basically, as the trauma orthopods look after the bones, I say that our role is looking after the soft bits, and um, that, that really relates to abdominal and thoracic trauma. Uh, so there's the initial uh, resuscitation and management of those patients, and then they do actually, as, as Hughes just alluded to, they do generate quite a lot of continuing work as well during their inpatient stay. Um, one thing when you work with anybody to do with trauma, they, they are all a bit anal and they, they're very, very good at recording data and knowing exactly what they do. And so we get um, helpful feedback from them. The first couple of years, just over 800 patients with, with an ISS of nine. And I'm afraid the writings are rather small, but selection of trauma laparotomies and trauma thoracotomies. And Last year, so 807 for the first two years of the MTC, last year, if you combine the, the yellow and the red, you can see that we managed 900 uh, cases. And, and, and it feels like that. It feels like since the MTC is open, there, there is an osmotic uh, effect and a drawing. And one little word can make a difference. When we started, it said isolated stab wounds of neck, thorax, or abdomen, consider transfer to MTC for the ambulance men. That consider has been been removed now so the MTC is taking all the all those stabbings so uh, it, it has changed the sort of work that we do um, for your information I know was not dealing with this on a regular basis the big surprise to me was the number of falls um, the, the the brown and the green is is patients who've fallen and uh, one of the Good presentation this morning was about the elderly and, and the problems associated with the elderly. And, and if you're 85 and you fall down two steps, you can end up with a subdural, a flail segment, and a liver laceration, as well as doing your hip at the same time. They just don't bounce. <clears throat> so, uh, in terms of uh, what causes a bad day, you, you, can, you can break it up into not being ready for it, and then if you were ready for it, not doing what you said you were going to do, all the time. <clears throat> all the time, human factors are terribly important because with trauma cases, you suddenly get pitched into all sorts of mayhem. And in order to, to, for the team to perform as well as it possibly can, you need to rehearse. And at the time, you need structured strategic decision-making and you need to be doing what you can to get the best out of your team and not, not fostering any sort of intimidation or, or uh, nerves. Um, when you look at the resources in terms of preparation that we're, I guess in this room, we're all sort of following this green line. And what this means is that you've got to throw quite a lot of resource at the trauma at the time. Um, not just to deal with the, the obvious casualties from the resuscitation room, but big, big lesson for me right at the beginning was that when you get multiple casualties, um, you get a great response in the emergency department and then everybody goes home and you suddenly find that there are seven patients with splenic lacerations, liver lacerations, ruptured, um, fractured pelvises who are scattered throughout the hospital. And, and you, do, you do need to keep quite a lot of resource from the surgical side in place to look after those patients during the first 24 hours. Um, <clears throat> how can you get prepared? Fantastic talk this morning, the, the, the Shields uh, lecture on simulation. And we all carry so much baggage with us um, because of how we've been examined and, and assessed and all the rest of it. It's remarkable how very quickly in a simulation people get into the zone. They, they, they forget the fact that it's a simulation. Uh, the adrenaline goes up and these are very good training grounds. Courses like the trauma skills and resuscitative thoracotomy are very good for the technical aspects, um, but you can't really beat that. This is a this is a moulage. Um, 
blast injury to the abdomen, but it's, it's in an actor. Um, you can set aside a trauma bay and actually rehearse a trauma call in, in real time in the trauma bay. At the LGI, we have trauma training days where we, we have um, uh, visitors from, from, from the region. Uh, we, we put them into uh, a resource situation with, with mic'd up and with cameras and then go, th go through a trauma call with, with uh, specialists sitting outside who'll be called in if needed um, and then go through that afterwards and look at what went well and what didn't go so well. So once you've prepared yourself, how do you actually, it's, it's a bad day in trauma, how do you stop it getting worse? It's about organization, how you make your decisions, and, and then, as I'm not going to touch too much on technique, because that, that's a whole separate issue, and then what you do afterwards. Um, big learning point for me has been the trauma CT. Um, it, you know, it, imaging is, is key in, in, in surgery, but... The trauma CT, uh, particularly in UK practice where we, the overwhelming majority of it is blunt, uh, trauma CT tells you what you're going to have to do, which body cavity you're going to have to do it in, and it does give you some idea of your therapeutic options at the time. In vascular surgery, we, we lived through the improved trial, which was a trial of randomizing ruptured aortic aneurysms to open or endovascular treatment, and that taught us quite a few lessons about how the CT can be a perfectly acceptable part of diagnosis in the unstable patient, providing it's, it's considered as a, an ongoing place for resuscitation. Um, the other big deal, of course, is that if you haven't got a CT, you're excluding your patient from, from, from an awful lot of endovascular treatment. And John, John talked about relationships with radiologists. For me, one of the great strengths of having vascular surgery involved in trauma is that we work with the interventional radiologists all the time. And in the, in the wee small hours, um, it's great to be working with someone who you're regularly working with on an elected basis. Um, why is it key? Because you've got to be quick. The, the trauma CT will help you make a speedy diagnosis, but the trauma team needs to get on with the decision making. And we've got big clocks put up in the, in the trauma base so that you keep a you keep an eye on things because it's remarkable how quickly time can slip away. And it's things like having pathways and, and practicing the routine which can help with this. Um, you can buy time. Um, the the uh, use of the, the, um, the, the aortic uh, occlusion balloon pre-hospital may have a role there. Our experience with, with aortic occlusion balloons is relatively limited, not least because um, you, you, you imagine how it's going to be uh, when you think about it, and then the patient comes in with a badly fractured pelvis and, and various other uh, problems which are going to get in the way with your access. And, and, and at that time, a resuscitative thoracotomy may, may be your only option. Um, I'll skip on from that one. Um, just to finish off with, with what we can and can't do, working with interventional radiology, the fantastic um, skill set for catheterizing vessels which are still in continuity. And this is why I would say early involvement of IR is critically important before you've tied off uh, or, or otherwise uh, spoiled too many access sites for interventional radiology. What have I learned? Um, same old lessons, really. Uh, the bowel's never going to look as pink in the next three days as it does now. And however confident you may feel about joining those ends together, think about what the patient's been going through in the last couple of hours. Did they come in with a very elevated lactate? If a young person comes in with a very elevated lactate, however they may look, physiologically they've had a, they've had a real disturbance. So... Uh, <clears throat> Damage control principles operate. The, the, the only thing that's going to be immediately fatal to the patient is going to be bleeding either in the, uh, in the abdomen or the head. And I feel especially privileged in Leeds uh, that there are uh, experts available who come very readily 
to help us out when we're dealing with um, the more complex trauma laparotomy situations. Uh, they come at the time, come afterwards on intensive care to review the patients together. Um, bad things do happen. Uh, this, this was traumatic for me. It wasn't a trauma case, but it's the entire iliac system come out on a uh, thoracic stent graft introducer. Um, when bad things happen, everybody is going to be under increased stress. Everyone's going to find things difficult. And, and there's a lot of talk about leadership in trauma. I think a very big focus of that is support. When things are starting to go wrong, the, the team leader, whoever he or, he or she happens to be, has got to make sure that everybody is supported to get the best out of them. It's not entirely altruistic. If you're supporting your scrub nurse, then he or she's going to work a lot better than if you're ranting and throwing instruments. Um, I'm just briefly going to touch on this as it, it may be uh, helpful for you. I, I've spilled a lot of venous blood over the years um, and I, I've learned some quite um, important lessons for me. First thing is that it really isn't often as bad as it looks. I mean, that was, that was a great video and, and bad venous bleeding is pretty scary. But if you can press on it and go and do something else for 10 minutes, it's uh, remarkable. If, we, if we're talking about the, the iliacs, for instance, it's remarkable what you can get away with. Um, but sometimes it is just as bad as it looks and very big veins do have a bad reputation. Um, this, isn't, this isn't a trauma case, this is a retroperitoneal lymphadenectomy. But, you know, who'd be afraid of that IVC? That, that's subdued and under control, you can do anything you like to it. And my experience with, with bad venous bleeding, particularly from, from very big veins, is that if you, if you leave it in its lair, if you try and stitch it, those stitches turn into tears and, and tears turn into splits. Once, once the vein has been mobilized, it's a completely different creature to deal with. So, so pressure and mobilization. And, and how do you do that mobilization? You sneak up on it. Yeah, and this is a, a big lump attached to some very big tubes, but the same, same principle applies, that you work around it. Don't get into the hematoma. Don't, don't get into the, the zone of trouble until you're happy that you've done as much control outside it as you can. Finally, uh, in this, uh, the, the debriefings, debriefings in, in the emergency department, when after trauma call, one that's gone well, one that's gone badly, they're very, very useful and they have to happen quickly. They have to happen quickly. Um, we go through replays in our governance meetings and, and in our partnership meetings. It's tough. It's not as tough as Korea, uh, where the, the, the Moynihan talk this morning, the resident said he hadn't been home in six months. Um, but it, it is tough. Uh, there is an impact on elective services. And, and personally, it's quite demanding to get involved in, in these kind of um, cases. But there is hope for the future. I think the MTCs are coming of age. Um, we need to look at soft tissue trauma training from my perspective as an MTC consultant, I know that some colleagues feel disenfranchised by this, that they feel that a big part of the job that they used to enjoy is now passing them by and coming straight into the MTC. And I think we've got to look to constructive approaches to job planning so that if, if surgeons, anesthetists, radiologists, if it's something in their careers they want to continue, we have to find ways of making that happen. Uh, the, the colleges have, have realized this. We have a major trauma workforce sustainability uh, working group uh, published last year. They've identified gaps of training and there are several good schemes proposed for it. Uh, I think from my perspective, having come to trauma age 55, um, it, you don't necessarily have to devote a whole training program from core trainee to it. I think surgical training is sufficiently robust and encompassing that moving towards 
an MTC in the last year or 18 months of training may well provide a lot of the skills that are needed. I'll skip those two. Um, for the, I think there's some younger members of the audience out there. Uh, just a couple of papers you might think of. On a, on a warm summer's evening in Leeds in the 1980s, all you could hear was a twang of the Vegas as it, uh, it was his cut of the hiatus. Uh, that was then. Uh, in deference to my chairman, I'm not going to say too much about the other paper, but uh, young men are always going to drive too fast. Um, two, two wheels is, is even more dangerous than four, and there's always going to be an excuse for a good ruckus. So trauma's not going to go away. Um, to conclude, this is Simon McPherson, our interventional radiologist, his weekend job. Um, in trauma, interventional radiology is, is crucial. It's trauma surgery's great experience in exposure, hemostasis, and, and human factor skills and situational awareness. Um, the great thing is you can practice most of it. It works best when people work together. Um, it is hugely rewarding as a, as a vascular surgeon dealing with patients at one end of their lives, uh, dealing with, with patients in the sort of 18 to 25 uh, age group is, is very, very rewarding. And I put it to you that it's a pretty safe bet for a career or a career change. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Thanks, Andrew. And moving on, uh, the final speaker, I know it's been very lead centric so far, um, to make it more relevant to Belfast, someone from this very parish. Mark Taylor is going to address the topic of a bad day on a tribut, tr sorry, liver trauma call. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Uh, as this is the last presentation of the three-day conference, I am going to show you no data, I'm going to show you no graphs and no evidence, all dogma for the last 15 minutes, um, a bad day on call for liver trauma. Actually, my registrar said coming in, uh, Mr. Taylor, most of your days on call are bad. Uh, I'm not sure what he was referring to. Let's look at the past. The US surgeon, Matas, described the master surgeon as a person with many qualities, a man of mind, thought, a man who knew the province of the human body, and as a whole, not only one of its parts. Unfortunately, that was the past. Uh, this is the present. Um, we have a world of subspecialization. We have a world where we are only isolated to the right upper quadrant or to the left uh, quadrant, but unfortunately, trauma uh, and trauma management knows no boundaries. And so uh, what I want to do is look um, at the role of a general surgeon dealing with major liver trauma, but actually to try and look at it outside the box. Now, uh, you have enjoyed this beautiful location in Belfast, but unfortunately, times are hard financially. So our Belfast Trust has um, issued a decree that they're not going to provide um, tea and coffee anymore at any business meetings. Uh, they will simply um, ask us to bring along a cup uh, and they will provide um, that cup full of tea. But we bring our own cup um, and they will provide the tea. So in terms of major trauma, our eloquent speakers have already highlighted the pressure and the stress that you go into in an abdomen full of blood. Um, I wanted us to try and look at liver trauma thinking outside the box. Um, clearly thinking outside the box, the trust did not specify uh, the size of cup. Uh, and therefore, um, I would certainly have plenty of refreshments at each meeting. So let's try and think outside the box in terms of liver. And when we think of liver trauma, we've got to look to the history uh, and to the history of the war, the First World War, uh, the Second World War. Many of the mistakes that we made in terms of trauma management and in more recent conflicts, uh, obviously it would be a, a remiss of me not to mention uh, the, the issues that we had in uh, this province over the years in terms of uh, uh, trauma and uh, violence. Um, but what lessons have we learned from the history of the past in terms of dealing with major trauma of the liver? 
the majority of trauma that we see in civilian practice is that of blunt trauma, uh, road traffic accidents. Um, as an avid cyclist, I know you find that hard to believe. Um, I often worry about vehicles um, uh, causing me great harm on the roads. Um, rarely we see penetrating um, injury uh, in civ uh, civilian practice. The difficulty for us all, and there's many trainees in the audience, is that the abdomen is the black box. It's really quite difficult to know the exact specific injury that has occurred at the time of the initial trauma, resuscitation and evaluation. Uh, and so the key um, is not necessarily to come up with an accurate diagnosis, but rather to have that index of suspicion that something's not right within the abdomen. And that classic horseshoe injury, where there's chest injury, pelvic injury, clearly there must be an abdominal injury component. In terms of the liver, we can see that 33% uh, of the time there is damage to the liver. And in fact, last evening, while I was enjoying myself, my uh, senior colleague was packing a uh, liver after a major trauma uh, in, in Northern Ireland. Um, the difficulty with the liver is that it bleeds. Um, sepsis is not necessarily as big a problem, but the big problem with that liver is it's a solid organ and therefore it will tend to bleed. One of the things I think we're quite bad at, um, although it is improving with Andrew's presentation in terms of trauma services, is the mechanism of injury. What actually happened at the scene before the patient come, came into hospital? And that actually um, gives us a lot of information. Uh, was it a steering wheel impaction against the chest and abdomen? Was it a compression injury? Was the casualty trapped in the vehicle for several hours? Um, and so that can actually help us with an index of suspicion for injury. So clearly this um, car has had better days, uh, and we can see that that person has a, a major splenic injury. So we can say, well, high impact, frontal uh, collision, um, resulting in a lap belt, blunt trauma injury to the spleen. I always remember the military surgeons talking about blood on the floor and four more, and that is obviously the four other areas where bleeding, if it's not visible, may actually be. Um, and in the abdomen, the liver and the spleen can certainly bleed significantly, causing hemodynamic compromise. Uh, this is one of my registrar's open cholecystectomies, um, but I thought that it might actually be a good example of sometimes in the resuscitation room, it does get extremely panicky. And what I want to try and do in terms of the liver today is look at a very simple rule of P's in terms of the management of such injury. And that is all about trying to temporarily arrest the bleeding, okay? I concur with Andrew that really trauma management has changed significantly now in our knowledge of hypotensive resuscitation in the speed at which CT scanning is performed now. And certainly in the arena of liver trauma, a CT scan is a must unless the patient is so hemodynamically unstable that they will arrest and die in the scanner. If we can at all possible, get a CT scan, and that's simply because non-operative management of liver trauma is not the exception. It is generally the rule in most cases of liver trauma. Um, the CT scan allows us also to see the lobes that are affected, to see the grading of the liver injury in terms of a laceration, a hematoma, a major lober disruption, a major druxta liver disruption where the cava is involved as well. And it also allows in a world of interventional radiology, the opportunity rather to open the abdomen and pack this patient to look at angiography and coiling of a branch of the left hepatic artery uh, as is in this case. However, if the patient is very unstable, we go to immediate laparotomy. And with immediate laparotomy, the aim is to turn off the tap. Um, and quite a lot has been um, said about the preoperative assessment of that trauma patient, what you need for the patient in terms of doing the trauma laparotomy, and quite often our uh, registrars are first to the scene um, and they're in theater. Um, and I think it's important that you drape the patient so that incisions can be extended. Um, 
in, in my training, we were always told about two suckers. I often wondered, was that the surgeon and the registrar? Um, but actually, two suckers, um, large packs and vascular clamps. And it's not that you want the suckers to drain the entire um, circulatory blood supply. It's simply that as you open the abdomen, there is a lot of bleeding that has occurred. The anaesthetist is actually acutely aware of it. And you want to get all of that blood evacuated or scooped out of the abdomen um, in order to then deal with the liver. So if you can see in the image, we have a, a, a split liver. Um, the liver has um, actually been split down the middle. We have a major liver injury. And clearly within that liver, uh, there's going to be bleeding from venous um, tributaries and almost certainly arterial tributaries. So the rules of engagement when you see that situation, it's damage limitation and you go to the rule of P's. And that is simply you place the liver back to what you believe anatomically it should look like. So if the liver is lying as an open book, you close the liver again, you position it or place it back to its a normal um, anatomical shape. You pack the liver. Now there's a, a, a multitude of concerns about how you pack a liver. Do you take down the falciform? Do you divide the triangular ligaments? What do you do? Do you have to mobilize the entire liver? And the answer is, Picture the scene, major right upper quadrant bleeding, gushing down towards you as you're looking up through your midline laparotomy. The aim of packing is to stop the bleeding, okay? And actually, we would tend to advocate that you take down the falciform, that's simply run the scissors, run the knife, straight down the falciform, but leave the triangular ligaments alone. If you're not familiar with triangular ligament mobilization of the livers, this is not the time to try and learn. This is the time to arrest the bleeding. So falciform down, pack on top of the liver, pack to the side of the liver to press it over, and then roll up a pack and put it under the liver in the subhepatic space. So we have a triangle of a liver, we have a pack in the top, a pack to the side, and a pack underneath. And I, I suppose a word of caution, because sometimes when we get uh, transfers up um, from other hospitals, um, because there's catastrophic bleeding, um, we sometimes have the syndrome of multiple packs. And the syndrome of multiple packs is you might have 10 abdominal packs inside the abdomen. Um, and the difficulty with 10 abdominal packs inside the abdomen, uh, back to Hugh's comments, is that there almost certainly is a compartment syndrome. So remember, we're trying to do no further harm. We're trying to arrest the bleeding, but we're not trying to tip the patient over into um, major compromise. So we have placed the liver, we have packed the liver, we can then pringle the liver, and pringle the liver is simply get your finger or thumb, index finger, round the back of the portal pedicle, up through the pars flaccida, and put a Fogarty catheter around it with a cut chest drain to snug down, whatever it is you want to use. Um, and actually that maneuver um, is, is not that difficult or complicated, okay? So position, pack, pringle, and another important P is to avoid the concept of peaking, okay? When you have that major bleed and you lift the liver up to have a little look to see if it's still bleeding, just don't do that. You don't need to peak, okay? And if all of those measures fail, we go to the final P, which is prayer, and you pray. Um, so no further surgery uh, until that patient is hemodynamically stable. Pack the liver close the abdomen with temporary closure, which I'll come on to, and transfer them to the intensive care unit for correct, correction of their major uh, consequences of hemodynamic um, control. That initial trauma laparotomy is not the time for suture ligation uh, of major lacerations of the liver. It's not the time to be trying even to do major liver um, resections. It is simply to try and get a very unstable patient to an area where all of the lactate and acidotic um, problems can be corrected. We've already seen an example of this, and this is a, a, a do not go near zone in trauma surgery. This is a retroperitoneal injury. And as Andrew eloquently said, the, the approach to this is a meticulous approach. That's an easier approach to make 
the day after someone's had a packed abdomen in intensive care than it is at the time of that initial trauma laparotomy. And again, coming carefully at it to um, uh, deal with it. We know so much about liver trauma because obviously we've had British Transplant Society here and we know from transplantation, the anatomical structures of the liver, but remember, that the hepatic veins are several centimeters distal to the right atrium where the entire preload of the heart is. So that is why in major caval or um, uh, hepatic vein injuries, you get audible uh, and major hemorrhage. Sometimes the liver trauma is not actually that significant after you come back the next day. Quite often when you take the packs out, the liver's dry and nothing further needs to be done. Um, but at the time of the initial surgery, it can be quite um, daunting. Obviously, we don't carry this with us at every trauma that we have. And this is simply a guide from the CT interpretation as to those liver injuries that we could try and treat conservatively. But actually, I want to uh, mention very quickly a case that happened about a month ago where a chap was in a major road traffic accident, had a grade four liver injury, multiple fractures of his pelvis, and came into the Royal Victoria Hospital. He clearly had a ruptured diaphragm on the right hand side and he had major grade four liver injury, but he was hemodynamically stable. So he was taken to the intensive care unit. His pelvic fractures were so bad that he couldn't have any form of fixation. He had a completely comminated pelvic fractures. Three weeks after that initial assessment, we decided to repair his diaphragm. And we took him to theater, potentially worried that we were gonna meet major bleeding from a liver which was now resident in his right chest. And actually, after three weeks, we had a completely sealed liver and a very straightforward diaphragmatic hernia or diaphragmatic uh, defect repair. And the message there was masterly inactivity waiting in this patient. Obviously, the dilemma of waiting too long for diaphragmatic um, injuries is that you may end up having to use a mesh repair. But the motto was that after three weeks, that wonderful organ called the liver had healed itself to the point where there was no added bleeding. So packing, treating the initial um, bleeding, the use of Pringle, et cetera, clearly delay any potential operative surgery that you may um, be considering. And for all the surgeons that are in district general hospitals and maybe you have a, 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 a location that's quite remote from the hepatobiliary unit, remember to pack the abdomen, to gotta bag the abdomen, and to send that patient up is a completely appropriate management strategy. Sometimes we go to uh, peripheral hospitals um, and most liver surgeons in the country are very comfortable either going to that hospital or the appropriate arrangements made to transfer uh, the patient up. If all else fails with major catastrophic bleeding, remember the role of the balloon. Um, and this balloon to tamponade a major hole in the liver, I have um, seen this used in major cardiac stabbing injuries where you're catastrophic bleeding, and in order to arrest the bleeding, putting in, uh, uh, this is a Sinstaken balloon, um, for those that are familiar with it, blowing it up and getting that patient out of theater to the intensive care unit. So if it's going really wrong, just remember at times the role of the balloon. Trauma hepatectomies are extremely rare. I've been involved in one and it was absolutely horrendous um, to do, uh, associated with a major uh, amount of blood loss. If you go back after packing the abdomen and you see a devitalized or, or a um, necrotic portion of liver, uh, then in that more controlled environment, a hepatectomy may well be needed. The ultimate aim of that initial assessment is damage control, which has already been mentioned, um, and to look at the role of temporary closure. Um, there's many different ways to close that abdomen um, temporarily. The use of pagoda bags, the use of uh, upside sandwiches, as Hugh mentioned earlier. Um, we're very uh, fond of the use of VAC and Aptheria um, for all the reasons the previous speaker has stated. And to have that patient transferred up 
we will take them back to theatre the next day, take that pack out and manage the liver. So in summary, Mr. Chairman, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, we can manage the majority of liver trauma conservatively. And even after a delayed period of conservative treatment, going back in to fix a diaphragm, etc., it is remarkable how the liver is healed. Liver packing should not be some very difficult science. Three to four packs around the liver is all that's required. Remember the rule of P's, position the liver, pack the liver, pringle the liver, don't peek and have the odd prayer. And if all fails, get help. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Just one quick question. In the pelvis, we use the hemostatic flow agents quite a lot. Any value at all to squirting those down, the crack in the liver before you pack? Or is that just, again, messing around? Yeah, um, I think one of the difficulties, um, Pete, with the hemostatic um, um, fluids is sometimes if you have major bleeding, it's like it going down the river, so the actual um, uh, hemostat flows away with the bleeding. Um, but actually, um, in the minor bleeding, yes, the use of hemostats can be used. Uh, and actually, a new product uh, uh, launched, which is for major catastrophic hemorrhage, which is a patch, um, has some very promising uh, results, particularly around caval bleeding, um, which may be of something of interest in the future. But generally, with the hemostats, if there's so much bleeding, quite often they, they wash away. Thanks, Mark. Thanks to all the speakers. I hope you've enjoyed your time at the ASGBI. Enjoy the rest of your time in Belfast and have a good weekend. Thank you.